Hi folks. One of the wonderful things about being grandparents that have grandkids that live with us is uh, being able to watch uh, kids movies um, and pretend it's for the grandkids and, and still enjoy it <laughs> and not raise eyebrows. Um, but have you ever seen the movie Toy Story? I saw it again uh, recently and there's one scene in there where Buzz Lightyear is running through the arcade and he, and he sees uh, a game that looks like a spaceship. And so thinking that this spaceship will take him to his destination, he enters this rocket ship, uh, his rocket shaped game, and, but he's still unaware that it's a toy. And inside the claw game is a crowd of little green uh, alien toys. And one of them says, a stranger, and the other one finishes this sentence, from the outside. <laughs> and then all, and with all, all of them together in excitement say, ooh. Buzz replies, Greetings. I am Buzz Lightyear. I come in peace. This is an intergalactic emergency. I need to commandeer your vehicle to Sector 12. Who's in charge here? The crowd of little green alien toys in unison all point up to the top of the machine and say, The Claw. <laughs> One says, the claw is our master. Another says, the claw chooses who will go and who will stay. Woody also makes his way into the machine and soon someone comes to play the game. The claw descends from the top of the machine and grabs one of the little alien toys, lifting him upward. The ascending toy yells out to the crowd of other toys, I have been chosen. <laughs> Farewell, my friends. I go to a better place. <laughs> Their whole world revolved around who would be chosen. There was anticipation and excitement as the claw descended from above. Who would be chosen? As I watched, I was struck with the symbolism. Jesus said in John chapter 8, verse 23, You are from below, I am from above. You are of this world. I am not of this world. 1 Peter 2, 9 tells us, But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of the darkness into his wonderful light. You see the similarities, folks? Today's uh, message is entitled, You have been chosen and the first point I want to make here is out of all the people in the world he chose you Matthew chapter 22 began with verse 1 and Jesus spoke to them again in parables saying the kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son he sent his servants to those who he had invited to the banquet to tell them to come but they refused and then some of more and then he sent some more servants and said tell those who have been invited that i have prepared my dinner my oxen and fatted cattle have been butchered and everything is ready to go come to the wedding banquet but they paid no attention and went off one to his field another to his business the rest seized his servants mistreated them and killed them the king was enraged he sent his army and destroyed those uh, murderers and burned their city then he said to his servants the wedding banquet is ready but those I invited uh, th those I invited did not deserve to come so go into the street corners and invite the banquet to the banquet anyone who you find and so the servants went into the streets and gathered all the people they could find the bad as well as the good and the wedding hall was filled with guests and when the came, king came in to see the guest he noticed a man who was not wearing wedding clothes he asked how did you get in here without wedding clothes friend the man was speechless then the king told his attendants tie tie him hand and foot and throw him into in, in outside into the darkness where there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are invited, but few are chosen. 
Deuteronomy 14.2 says, For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. Out of all the peoples on the face of the earth, the Lord chose you to be his treasured possession. And that should make you feel special. Out of all the people in the world, God chose you. And so the second point here is that God has examined your heart. God has examined your heart. 1 Samuel chapter 16, and, and this is uh, when Samuel anoints David. Uh, verse 1, The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul? since I have rejected him as king over Israel. Fill your horn with oil and be on your way. I am sending you to Jesse in Bethlehem. I have chosen one of his sons to be king. As Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hears about it, he will kill me. The Lord said, Take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice and I will show you what to do. You are to anoint for me the one I indicate. Samuel did what the Lord said, and when he arrived at Bethlehem, the elders of the town trembled when they met him. They asked him, Do you come in peace? And Samuel replied, Yes, in peace. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come to the sacrifice with me. And then he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. And when they arrived, Samuel saw Iliad and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed stands here before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart and then Jesse called Abimadad and had him pass over in front of Samuel and Samuel said the Lord has not chosen this one either and Jesse uh, had then had uh, Shammah pass but Samuel said no, nor has the Lord chosen this one and Jesse had Seven of his sons passed before Samuel, but Samuel said to him, The Lord has not chosen these. Uh, so he asked Jesse, Are these all the sons that you have? There is still the youngest, Jesse answered. He is tending the sheep. Samuel said, Send for him. Uh, we will not sit down until he arrives. And so they sent for him and had him brought in. He was glowing with health and it had a fine appearance and handsome features. Then the Lord said, Rise and anoint him. This is the one. And so Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David. You see, God chose David because of his heart, not because of his appearance. God looks beyond our outward appearance. He gets up close and personal. He looks into the very core of who you are. That might make some of us uncomfortable because our heart tells a lot about us. We cannot hide what's in our hearts. Some of us probably need to have a change of heart. Our heart drives the way we live our lives. We need to, we need to make sure that our heart's in the right place. Jesus says in Matthew 5, 8, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. God has examined your heart. <laughs> what has he found? <laughs> the next point is, God knows all about you. There are no secrets from God. He knows everything there is about you. Psalm 139 makes that very clear. For you search me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before his word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. 
you hem me in behind and before, and you lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go to the heavens, <laughs> you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. I will rise on the wings of the dawn. If I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me, and the light becomes night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like day, for darkness is as light to you. For you created my inmost being, you knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful, I know that full well. And see, God knows you intimately. He knows everything about you. He knew you before you were even born. And so you can't hide anything from God. He knows all about you. That's kind of scary too, isn't it? God knows all about you. He knows all your little secrets. Yeah, he knows everything about you. He knows what you're going to say before you say it. He knows what you're going to do before you do it. God knows everything about you. And the last point I want to make is God has a special plan for you. Each of us is different. God made us that way and has a special and unique, unique plan for each and every one of us. Ephesians chapter 1, begin verse 3. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For He chose us in Him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in His sight, in love. He predestined us uh, for the adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with His pleasure and will to, to the praise of His glorious grace which He has freely given us in the one He loves. In Him we have the redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sin in accordance with the riches of God's grace that He lavished on us. With all wisdom and understanding, he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which, is, which he proposed in Christ, to be put into effect when the times reach their fulfillment, to bring unity of all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. In him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the to the plan of him according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will in order that we who were the first to put our hope in Christ might be the praise of his glory and you are also and you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in Him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of His glory. Isn't that wonderful? He chose you before you were even here. <laughs> 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 26 through 30. Brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. <laughs> I know that's me. Not many were influential. Me again. Not many uh, were of noble birth. That's me also. But God chose the foolish things of this world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. Look at those disciples that were around Jesus. 
They weren't the most well thought of in the community, and yet he chose them for this very important mission that he had. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus who has become for us wisdom from God. That is our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. You see, God has a special plan for you. Not sure what it is? <laughs> Here's something. Why not ask Him? <laughs> Get into His Word. Approach Him in earnest and open prayer. Find out what His plan is. And then submit to it without reservation and never look back. God has a special plan for you. There is an article on, from the Mich, uh, International Mission Board site, and it's entitled Missionaries You Should Know, Lilius Trotter. The life of uh, Isabel Lilius Trotter challenges the world's meaning of success and potential and fulfillment. And this was written by uh, Paula Hempfell. Um, Lilius was born in 1853 into a wealthy Victorian family and they considered the value of walking humbly before God to be of first importance. A talented artist, she attracted the attention of John Ruskin, the, notice, the noted uh, Victorian art critic and Oxford lecturer, who took her under his wing and declared that she was destined to be one of the greatest artists of her time. Her future looked bright with fame and riches on the horizon, her paintings were remarkable. Some of her paintings and leaves from her sketchbook can be found in the Ashmolean Museum in Oxford, England. In 1874, Lillis attended a six-day convention that emphasized the importance of the daily application of Scripture in her quest for a deeper intimacy with God. She experienced a renewed vitality in personal and corporate worship. Her call to wholeheartedly follow Christ in obedience came during a call to prayer. She wrote of this in her journal, to bear his name with all that is wrapped up in it of fragrance and healing and power to enter his eternal purpose is the calling for which it is well worth all things as loss. From then on, rather than invest her extraordinary life in the things of this world, Lillis was compelled by a strong yearning for her Savior and the world he loves. In radical obedience, she left the promising artistic career that John Ruskin had offered her and the comforts of England for a life of missionary service in Algeria. She had applied to a missionary organization but they but was turned down because they thought that she was too frail to meet the demands of life in Algeria. Undeterred, the 34-year-old promising artist Isabel Lillis Trotter landed in North Africa in 1888 along with two of her friends. They had neither mission agency support nor training but immediately they began studying the Arabic language and the with the intention of sharing the gospel as widely as they could or as long as they could. For the next 40 years this creative dynamic woman pulled out her life her artistic abilities and her linguistic skills to make the gospel known amid many difficulties. Her journals, many, which uh, include uh, small paintings and pictures as well, tell of her daily experience of desperately depending on the divine resources of the Holy Spirit. 
through Trotter's art, writings, and her life story, uh, come the glimpses of Christ's power in the prayers of his child and faithful witness. Her day-by-day, decade-by-decade journals reveal a life characterized by her trust in her Savior and her inward rest in his power and victory over sin and darkness. Her success should not be measured numerically, but rather in the fact that Lilith succeeding in learning about prayer and love for Muslims. Her life attests to an exceeding value of knowing and preferring Christ above all else. Her personal devotion to Jesus Christ is exemplary and instructive, not only for inspire, aspiring missionaries, but all who desire to live wholeheartedly for the glory of God. Lilith's passionate prayer intercessions for the Algerians provided inspiration to those who desire to see all people worship God. She spent lengthy, frequent sessions of retreat in the hills overlooking the city of Algiers. She prayed and turned her, eye, and turned her eyes on Jesus, His Word, and His revelation in creation. As she watched the broken waves pushed by the heart of the ocean crashing on the shore of the bay, she waited with faith to see God's high tide sweep across the Muslim world. Lillis was a contemporary of the great missionary of the Muslims, Samuel Zwimmer. She learned much from him about the power of prayer to pierce the veil of darkness shrouded shrouding the Muslim hearts and to engage in the spiritual battle of souls of those held captive by the adversity. Her example of perseverance in prayer is an encouragement to those today who are interceding for God's high tide to fill the earth and sweep away the veil of darkness. The writings of Lillis Trotter uh, recognize the work of adversity to hold non-believers captive, cap, captive through their unbelief and his powers to keep his power to keep the life-giving truth from reaching them. And she pled for Christians to ask God to do a new work among hard-bound peoples and to generate a fire of the Holy Spirit to melt away through the ice barriers and set a host free. Courageous and innovative in her witness to the Algerians, Lilith observed and learned to witness effectively to her neighbors. In 1919, Lilith began writing tracts for the Nile Mission Press. She assisted a Swedish missionary in the translation and editing of the Gospels of Luke and John into colloquial Arabic, into a language that the Arab mother could read to her child. She also wrote stories in parable form that appealed to her audience, and she creatively illustrated them in Eastern style and the results of which gained wide circulation. The story of Lilius Trotter continues to inspire and mobilize those who long to worship around the throne of Christ with all the peoples. She laid down, she laid down her life and talents and allowed Christ to use her in creative and innovative ways. Her life was one of passionate prayer dependence on God's overcoming power and confidence in proclaiming the life-giving Word of God. Her story encourages others to follow in her footsteps and consecrate their life to the hardest work and the darkest sinners. Helen H. Lamell's story is quite something as well. 
in the early 1900s, she toured the United States as a vocalist and gave numerous concerts in cities and churches. Then, a tragedy struck that would have a life-altering effect. She was diagnosed with an affliction that would result in blindness. Her husband, unable to cope with this reality, abandoned the marriage, leaving her to cope on her own. What might have been a debilitating, debilitating experience, physically as well as emotionally, only turned her more completely to God and to her most compelling vocation, the composing of hymns from the depths of her heart and life experience. She authored around 500 hymns, lyrics, and music, and music, many of them still in circulation to this day. Two women who sought God's will for their lives that he had chosen them to do. One of Lilius Trotter's journal entries was published in a little leaflet called Focus. The entry read, and this is Lilith that was the missionary, Turn your soul's full vision on Jesus and look and look at him. And a strange dimness will come over all that is apart from him and the divine attributes by which God's saints are made even in the 20th century will lay hold to you. <laughs> Two decades later, it became the inspiration for Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus, written by a blinded singer who had started to write hymns, Helen H. Limmel. Can you see God's work here? Can you see how God had a plan all along. These two, separated by miles, separated by time, and God's plan was carried out. Can you see what happens when ones who, have, who are chosen give themselves over fully to what God wants them to do? Each and every one of you have been chosen out of all the people in the world he chose you God has looked into your heart and he has seen the real you he knows all about you and he has looked after you even before you were born he has a specific plan for you something he uniquely designed you for you hear him speaking to you? Are you listening? What is God asking you to do for him today? It is time to surrender to his will and watch his plan unfold. Take that leap of faith today. Let God soar in your life just like Lilith's and Helen's life. You have been to chosen. Take the leap of faith and fully surrender to his plan for your life. I'm hoping right now there's some excitement in you when you think about being chosen. That it is a special thing for you. And that you will come to a place where you will do anything for God. Anything that he asks so that you can live out the purpose that he has for you. I love you all. I miss you all. May God bless.